Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad and this time I have watched Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 at 0.25x speed and found 16 new details that you might have missed in regular speed. So without wasting your time, let's jump straight to the point. Number 1. Peter Parker has a duct tape on his backpack. This shows that he was struggling financially and couldn't afford a new backpack. I'm pretty amazed by the attention to details in all of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films. Considering the time it was made, I really didn't think watching this series in slow motion would be worth Worth it. But I was so wrong. Sam Raimi has paid so much attention to details that after watching it in 0.25x speed, I appreciate this movie's even more now. Number 2. At the beginning of the film when Peter had to make some pizza delivery in 7 minutes, he hits a car. But because I watched it in slow motion, I could easily see the face of the stunt double who was actually riding the bike. Here's how it looks at regular speed. <laughs> Number 3. In the scene where Peter Parker is having dinner with Dr. Otto Octavius, he mentions the curve of Quickest Descent. Did Bernoulli sleep before he found the curves of Quickest Descent? Oh, Rosie, I love this boy. Now, there's a very special reason why, out of all things, Peter mentioned Bernoulli's principle. It's because when Spider Man swings, he practically uses this equation of physics in order to travel as fast as possible. Let me simplify this even more for you. Bernoulli discovered that in order to descend in the quickest way possible, you should use a curved path instead of a straight one. If you use a straight path, you'll be traveling the least amount of distance. But that doesn't mean you can reach your destination in the quickest way. Because if you do want to reach your destination in the quickest way, then a curved path is the one you should use. Even though you'll be traveling more distance, but because the path is curved, it will generate more speed and will make you travel as fast as possible. And throughout this movie, Spider-Man follows this equation of physics so that he can travel in the fastest way possible. Number 4. When Peter Parker pays a visit to the bank with Aunt May, Dr. Octavius was also there to steal money. And that's where Spider-Man fights Octavius for the first time. But if we slow down the speed, we can see that Aunt May and the bank bank teller are crawling in the background, making the scene much more realistic. Number 5. At this point, we are all fans of this famous train sequence, but upon doing some research on this scene, I found out that these two kids who gave Spider-Man his mask back were in fact half-brothers of Tobey Maguire in real life. Number 6. Bruce Campbell portrayed the role of an usher at a play and says the line, it helps maintain the illusion. It helps maintain the illusion. His line, it helps maintain the illusion, was setting him up as Mysterio for a future Spider-Man movie. And he was supposed to play the villain Mysterio in the unreleased Spider-Man 4. Bruce Campbell also played the wrestling announcer in Spider-Man 1 and the host of a restaurant in Spider-Man 3. So there was always a theory that he was already Mysterio in all three Spider-Man films as an easter egg. Which brings me to my next point, number 7. When Bruce Campbell's character wasn't letting Peter in for being late, notice Peter for a moment considered webbing him up so that he could go in. Number 8. The address on Peter's helmet says 233 Bleecker Street, and we saw in Thor Ragnarok that Doctor Strange lives in 177A Bleecker Street. What makes it interesting is the fact that Sam Raimi will direct Doctor Strange 2, who happens to live on the same street in New York where Sam Raimi's Peter Parker used to work. And that brings me to my next point, number 9. When Mary Jane, Harry, and Aunt May threw a surprise party for Peter's birthday, MJ says Peter lives in another reality because he wasn't aware it's his birthday already. He lives in another reality. Yes. Oh, you peep. Now this might sound like a stretch, but living inside another reality doesn't that ring a bell? This could again be another nod to Doctor Strange comics. Talk about Raimi's fixation on Doctor Strange. Number 10. When Peter decided to stop being Spider-Man, he threw out his suit in the garbage bin. This shot of Peter throwing his suit and then walking away is derived exactly from Spider-Man No More comics, from which the film draws inspiration. Number 11. After Aunt May inspires Peter into becoming Spider-Man again, Peter then jumps off the roof of a building. But just before making the jump, he says he needs a strong focus on what he wants. Strong focus on what I want. Peter then crash lands on a fourth focus which remains undamaged, implying his focus may not be strong enough, but this fourth focus is definitely strong. I'm back! My back! Oh, my back! Oh. Get out of here, 
Number 12. Back in Spider-Man 1, we saw a license plate on a police car that was a reference to Steve Ditko's birth year. And again in this movie, Peter's landlord is called Ditkovich, which is a reference to Steve Ditko who co-created Spider-Man with Stan Lee. Number 13. At the end of the movie, Harry Osborn finds out the secret vault of his father. He then attends the wedding of Mary Jane. So at this point, Harry already knew that his father was in fact the Green Goblin. But notice he was wearing a green bow tie in the wedding, implying that he has now taken his father's mental as the new Green Goblin. Or I'm just reading between the lines a bit too much and this doesn't mean anything. Moving on. Number 14. The final scene of the movie where Peter swings around the city was actually reused again in the opening scene of Spider-Man 3. They just color corrected the scene and changed a few angles. Number 15. The guy on the bridge yelling at the Green Goblin in Spider-Man 1 is the same guy in this movie that tells Peter there's someone stuck inside the burning building. Number 16. Now this detail has nothing to do with me watching this film in slow motion but it's something that I observed throughout the course of this film. The parts of MJ's play directly relate to the relationship between Peter and MJ as well as Peter's identity crisis. In the first play, Mary Jane is asked by her co-star if they should forgive once again, which she has been doing a lot with Peter. She instinctively says yes before correcting herself, implying that this time she will not forgive Peter. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean no. Then in the second play, when later on in the movie, Peter gives up on being Spider-Man, Mary Jane calls out her co-star's character for living a double life and trying to be something he's not, just like Peter is doing, trying to pretend he's not Spider-Man anymore. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. So MJ's play wasn't just something random they put in the movie. It had meaning and was connected to the arc of Peter and MJ. And that's it. These are my findings from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 and I hope I was able to give you at least a few new details through this video. And if I did, then please grab the subscribe button and give me a thumbs up and follow me on Instagram where I post updates about my videos. Till then, I will see you lads in the next one.